So how are we all doing this morning? Are we awake yet? Uh, I'm not. <laughs> so uh, my name is Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate at Redis. I always like to introduce this slide with a, there are three things that uh, matter on this slide. One of them matters to you, one of them matters to me, and one of them matters to my boss. Any guess which thing matters to my boss? I'll give you a hint. Uh, I work for Redis. Uh, how many here have used Redis before? About half of you? That's, that's pretty typical. So, uh, and how many here have used it as a cache? How many have used it as, as anything else? A couple of you. What do you use it for? Uh, notifications using uh, PubSub? What, someone else? PubSub. PubSub. Yeah, that's, that's, that's always number two on the list. So, um, and so what, one of the things my boss wants everyone to know is Redis has more than PubSub. It has uh, more than getting set. It's more than a cache. It can actually be your primary database. It's got lots of cool features. We're going to look at one of those features today, but mostly we're going to look at uh, software-defined radio. But the feature we're going to look at a little bit is uh, event streaming in Redis. And it's very light on the uh, what is an event stream. Just to show you how it works. Uh, the thing on this slide that matters to me is that Twitter ID right there and the social media links and all that. I judge my value as a human being based on how many people follow me on Twitter. And if you're on Blue Sky, uh, anyone on Blue Sky yet? There's only 60,000 people on there right now, but it's, uh, it's Jack's uh, new uh, Twitter alternative. It looks just like Twitter, but it's not. I'm at guy.dev on there. So. And the thing on this slide that matters to you, and this is actually the most important thing on this slide, is that GitHub URL. So all the code for this uh, crazy monstrosity of a piece of software I've built is out there on GitHub for you to go play with as well. You'll need to buy a little bit of hardware to do it. So, welcome to tracking aircraft with Redis and software-defined radio. Are we excited? Thank you for faking it. <laughs> a couple caveats about this talk. Uh, this is a caveat I, I tend to use quite a bit, which is I am not an expert. Um, I actually hate the word expert because it says so much, but it doesn't say anything at all. Uh, there are probably people out there that think you are experts at computers. <laughs> and you're like, no, mom, I'm not going to fix your PC or your Mac. But if your mom's running Linux, I want to know. <laughs> uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm fairly new to uh, radio. I've been doing it for about a year now. I've got my uh, well, ham radio license. Um, and so, you know, I could say th some things that are not quite exactly accurate, but that's okay. The goal here is to introduce you to something and get you excited. Uh, this is, uh, you know, basically I've got an hour and some toys, and so there's a lot of demos. So I'm going to spend a lot of time not in slides and a lot of time showing you how to do cool stuff. That's probably acceptable. I'm, I'm guessing, right? And uh, this isn't as true as it used to be because I've honed this talk down, but this talk is still a little bit all over the place. And the reason it's all over the place is because um, I built a cool thing using a lot of tech, and that tech involves radio. I've got my little handheld here, tuned to the official, uh, as of last night, frequency for uh, Star Trek, which is 445.475 megahertz in the 70 centimeter band. It involves uh, talking about aircraft and pulling data off of aircraft transponders. Uh, it uses event streams. And in addition to event streams, it actually uses a whole bunch of other stuff in Redis. In fact, Redis is kind of the heart of what I built. So, so there's a lot of pieces, parts moving here. I'm going to touch on a couple of them. But the most important question is, which you're probably all wondering is, what the hell is software-defined radio? Well, we all know what radios are. We've all been exposed to radios our entire lives. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a member of the ARRL. If you're a ham radio operator, you probably know what that is. If you're not, uh, it's, I think it stands for the American Radio and Relay League. I think that's right. But it's basically like the AAA for ham radio operators. And um, they just had their 100th anniversary. So radio has been a part of our lives for all of us in this room our entire lives. A software-defined radio, as opposed to a regular radio, it's, a, like, it's like a regular radio. It's like one of these guys right here. Like, you see the picture there. This is a cheap Baofeng radio I bought on Amazon for like 25 bucks. I think the aftermarket antenna I put on it costs more than the radio itself. Um, or uh, here, we've got in, in the picture here, we've got a... Uh, a very expensive HF uh, Kenwood. 
Those run for about $1,000, roughly. $1, they get into four-figure territory. Um, Software-defined radios like these radios, but these radios have a bunch of circuitry in them to uh, do things like decode the signal. You've probably heard of FM and AM. Those are not bands. Those are ways of encoding data on a radio wave. FM is frequency modulation, you vary the frequency back and forth. AM is amplitude modulation, you vary the amplitude of the signal up and down. And these radios have circuitry in them that knows how to decode that and turn it into something for you to listen to. And there's lots of different ways of encoding this stuff, and these radios have lots of circuitry to do that. A software-defined radio doesn't have that circuitry. It just has the receiver. A software-defined radio is a radio that you plug into your computer. It has a port for an antenna, it has a USB port. And uh, I gave this talk in Poland a, uh, a few weeks ago, and they asked me, how did you get this into the country, you know, the software-defined radio? And I said, well, it's all about proper labeling. <laughs> so software-defined radio doesn't have all the demodulating stuff. It, it's something you plug in your computer. And the magic of it is, is that all that demodulating and decoding is done by software. So you can get a lot of that circuitry that's in the radio and offload it into software. And so it can take a radio that could cost hundreds of dollars and turn it into a little dongle that you plug in your computer that costs 30. And uh, in addition to uh, allowing you to then use software to demodulate, there's a lot of data being sent out there as well, and you can decode that as well. And so I, it's often easier just to show you what software-defined radio is rather than tell you. So I have on my computer here a software-defined radio plugged in. I'm not going to show you because I'd have to unplug it and that would break things. But I am going to show you use it in action. So I've got it hooked in here. And over here, I've got an antenna uh, stuck to that pole there precariously. And we're going to watch it work. So let me go into this piece of software here. I'm going to select. And I apologize for the super tiny font on this. It's hard for me to read, too. I haven't figured out how to change the font on this, this particular program. But I'm connecting to my software-defined radio. And I'm going to give it a frequency, 162.55 megahertz. Anyone here know what frequency that is? It's your NOAA weather radio uh, for, for Columbus. And it's a great one to use because then when this video goes on YouTube, there's no copyright strikes. <laughs> so as I turn this on here, let me make this, let me embiggen this. You can see the signal, right? That is the National Weather Radio broadcasting their audio. If we want to listen to it, we can go ahead and let's see if this works. Go to narrowband FM, that one right there, apply. Winds five to 10 miles an hour. Tonight, mostly clear. Lows in the mid 40s. Not cool. East winds around five <laughs> miles an hour. Saturday, mostly. And so this is broadcasting. In fact, uh, this can pick up, this software defined radio I'm using can pick up signals from about 300 kilohertz all the way up to about two gigahertz. And in fact, I've got a little handheld radio here that I'm going to, uh, to demo this with as well. So I have tuned it to 445475. So that's the frequency I want to use. And if I go over here, so I'm not too close, and I'm, yeah, I, I don't have any audio going out, but I don't want to be super close to the antenna, so. Uh, radio check, Kilo Echo 8, Victor India Yankee at the Surtrek conference. And so you can see my signal just came across the, the, wire, the line there. So. Real radio, it picks up stuff. It's receive only, but I could tune this radio to like a local radio station and listen to it. I can tune this to the weather radio. If I have the right kinds of antennas, I can listen to shortwave radio. I can listen to everything. So it's pretty cool. Uh, my favorite thing to do with it that I haven't successfully done yet, the thing I want to do the most, that'd be a better way to say that, right? Is uh, you can use this to decode satellite images off of NOAA weather satellites. Uh, so, and they just sort of like, they just like panning and scanning the entire earth and they just, image comes in, radio goes out. It's all analog. And you can pick that up and actually decode it using this software I was just showing you and get images from space in real time. How cool is that? For 30 bucks <laughs> and a homemade antenna, which is made out of an old set of rabbit ears. So, so that's what software defined radio is simply put. Uh, here's some of the, the, the hardware that I've used, uh, that I'm using here. 
Um, this is the RTLSDR.com. Or, or, it's called the .com on the thing. I don't know why. Um, maybe it was made in the 90s. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is a simple SDR kit. It comes with some antennas and getting you up and running and listening to stuff very quickly. Uh, that kit's probably, with all the antennas, is probably about 50, 60 bucks. Uh, the SDR itself is I, are about 30 bucks now. Uh, if you want to listen to shortwave, you can make some homemade antennas, but I've had a lot of luck with this particular one. It's a loop antenna. Uh, it was, I think I paid $40 for it, uh, and I literally used this antenna. I hung it in my dining room window facing east, and I picked up a shortwave radio station, commercial, with a lot of power, from Lhasa, Tibet. So I, I, literally the other side of the planet. Very cool, right? And, uh, but if I was uh, going to start over and just buy a kit, I'd probably buy this kit here. Uh, one of the things with this SDR, the, the, the cheap one that I, I'm using today, is that to get into the HF frequency, where all the shortwave, long-range stuff happens, um, it's kind of a hack and it's noisy. There's a lot of interference. And this has what's called an upconverter uh, by New Electric, which takes... It's designed to listen to that lower frequency and then bumps it up to a higher frequency so that your regular SDR, which is also included in the kit, uh, can, can hear it. And it's got some other things that make it very easy to make your own antenna. Like uh, this little thing right here. Let's see if I can get my pointer there. Right there is a ballon. And that is an easy way to uh, hook your SDR up to a homemade antenna. And I literally use that with a piece of bell wire that was about 40 feet long that I attached to the playground in the backyard and was able to pick up shortwave radio stations. So antennas don't need to be fancy. If you're a ham, uh, uh, you, you probably know antennas have to be the right length and have the right uh, tuning to be used uh, correctly uh, for transmit. But for receive, it's actually really, really forgiving. So you can make a super janky antenna and still get stuff. So it's really fun, accessible, it's very hackable. It's a lot of fun. For software, all the software is free. If you're a Windows user, which is probably about half of you, uh, SDR Sharp runs on Windows nicely. It's a really good experience. Uh, given the name, any clue as to what language it's written in? Yes, it only runs on Windows. Uh, but it is a really solid piece of software, and it's got a whole plug-in architecture. If you're running Windows, it's a good option. Uh, GQRX is, uh, uh, is an older one that works really well on uh, Linux. Like, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. And so some people create little radio appliances, for lack of a better term, using a Raspberry Pi and uh, GQRX and a software-defined radio. A cubic SDR works nicely on a Mac. Um, it's open source. It runs on lots of computers, but uh, it's, it's one that I got working the best on my Mac until SDR Angel came out. The one I demoed earlier is SDR Angel. Uh, it's really powerful, and if you're a ham, you can do uh, transmit and receive with it if you have the right equipment. And um, it's, um, it's got a lot of stuff baked into it. So, like, if you wanted to code satellite images with, say, SDR Sharp, you have to then patch your audio out and de decode your audio, patch it to another program, which then turns it into data. And so you're doing, like, virtual audio cable swaps and stuff. SDR Angel has a decoding option for those satellite images. It's very powerful. Its learning curve is a little steep. But once you figure it out, it's, it's really the best tool, in my opinion. It is a little unstable. Uh, all this stuff is built by volunteers and hobbyists and enthusiasts. So. But if you want to get started playing with this stuff, these are, these are the things you would use. And the cool thing I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of data formats out there. I mentioned, mentioned the NOAA weather formats, the NOAA weather satellite images. But there's actually a lot of data formats that you can pick up with an SDR. Probably the most old school data format is arguably not a data format at all. We've all heard of Morse code. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Uh, Morse code is, uh, is really not data. It's encoding. And it's actually uh, hard to machine decode. Because uh, just like character, handwritten character recognition was a hard problem until convolutional neural networks, Morse code tends to have those sort of artifacts in it like humans do because it's keyed by humans. If you do machine keyed Morse code, then it can be, of course, decoded easily with machine. But if you're doing it by hand, it's often hard to do. But it's out there. There's a lot of it. It's, I, honestly, I don't know Morse, but it's, it just, it's kind of cool sounding to listen to. It feels like the 50s. It's a lot of fun. Uh, RIDI is an actual data format that's machine encoded and decoded. RTTY, radio teletype. Uh, this, this works over shortwave. 
down in HF. And uh, this used to be how like reporters would get news and messages. You know, this is your reporter from Cairo in you know 1940, and and they would send them over radio using radio teletype. There's still a, an enthusiastic amateur uh, audience for this, where people will communicate over uh, RTTY or RIDI. APRS is a much more modern standard. It's the automatic packet reporting system. Um, how many here are familiar with X25? It's like, I'm a developer, I don't care about the network, it's infinite, I just got it, right? <laughs> Few of you. So X25 is an underlying, it's very low on that OSI network stack chart that you might have learned about in college and never used since. Um, and um, it's a protocol, it's, it's how you encode packets of data over ethernet. Uh, APRS uh, uses a protocol, is built on top of a protocol called AX25, which is amateur X25 and it sends radio packets out instead. And you can do these over several frequencies. They operate at about 1200 baud. They actually use the same encoding that old school modems do. And so when you listen to them, it, it reminds me of being in college connecting to a BBS with my cheap modem that was too slow. And I'm not talking the 56K uh, modems that you use to get onto uh, the internet millennials. I'm talking about the, uh, to the Gen Xers. <laughs> um, the really old school, uh, uh, 1200 baud, right? It's just real slow. And uh, APRS is uh, sort of this network of uh, devices just sort of shouting out information. And it's, uh, it's not trying to guarantee delivery like a packet-based data network normally would. It's just saying, here's a packet encoded this way. If you get it, you get it. And so there's all these uh, things out there emitting radio packets. Uh, Things like vehicles, people will uh, say, I'm in my car, usually they get a handheld like this that will broadcast their location and uh, their call sign and information uh, from their vehicle. And then as they drive around, you can see where they're going. And you know, if, if you know, you're like delivering something important, then that could be useful. It's mostly people just want their uh, little car to show up on a map. That's really what most people use it for. Uh, there are, and this is more useful, there are weather stations that people will put on top of their houses that will every 20 minutes broadcast out an APRS packet saying, hey, the weather conditions at this location, latitude, longitude, are cold, you know. And individuals can also uh, send packets themselves. These packets can contain text. So I could send a packet from a radio, and if you have a radio as well, it would show this for me with my call sign, and I could send you like a short little text message, and then you could text me back. And so, all these uh, packets are being generated using APRS. They are broadcast out and they are picked up by other individuals, so anyone can listen to them. Uh, they are picked up by repeaters in the area and repeated multiple times. So if I broadcast a packet near a tower, then that tower might pick it up and repeat it, and then that next one would pick it up and repeat it. And there's a scheme for making sure that it doesn't just turn into an endless ripple, and so you don't get loops and stuff. And uh, some of these repeaters, are, and, and lots of uh, just nodes are what are called internet gateways. Because the APS system, APRS system, isn't just packets of data going over radio. So, some of these towers will pick them up and then feed them into uh, the internet. And there's a whole cluster of servers that manage all the APRS data worldwide. And so this allows you to do interesting things like, I want to send a packet from, uh, a message from me to someone in Spain. I can address their call sign, and it will go into the internet and then come back out to the internet and broadcast from one of these eye gates. So these eye gates are bi-directional. So it's pretty cool. Uh, there's other things like uh, there's a little uh, weather bot called WXBot. You can send it a zip code. And it'll tell you the weather forecast for that location. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. There's even an APRS repeater on the International Space Station, and you can bounce a yeah, signal off the International Space Station and back down, which lets you get a lot further than locally. APRS is really cool. It's a big topic. I could do an entire talk on it. Um, I normally try to demo it, but it's hard to pick up packets sometimes, but we, we could try. I mean, actually, eh, I don't want to take, I'm not going to take the time. Um, I, I, it'll be a little bit of a distraction. Yeah, let's do it. You want to do it? Okay. Redis later. <laughs> Sorry, boss. <laughs> This isn't on the internet, is it? No. <laughs> Let's go ahead and turn this guy back on here. Whoops. Not like that. 
Come on. We'll connect to the SDR again. And we'll go to 144.39. We'll hit play. We'll turn off that little DC spike there. And then we'll turn the gain up. And we'll see if any come by. Well, I should, I should have had this up while I was talking about them. Oh, there's one. There's, there's a bit of one. See right there? Let's see if we can turn the audio on. So these are literally, um, yeah, there was another one coming through there. So there, I am able to pick up a few here. Everyone see that okay? As we just, let's all just stare at the screen. It was the most exciting talk ever. <laughs> <coughs> we may not pick up the audio. Now there's, they're kind of faint, so it's not, it, it's not getting overcoming the squelch. But, um, but you can see what they look like. There's these little blips of data. And they all uh, are going into a website at, um, let, let's go, uh, APRS.FI. And so here's uh, like all the nodes that are out there that are broadcasting information. So we're down here somewhere. Uh, this one is actually near my house. It's just a little tower. Here's a weather station, and I, I know this is tiny, I apologize. There we go. And so this is uh, some weather stations, broadcasting says it's 50 degrees, kind of low pressure, winds 2.9 miles an hour, et cetera. So there's all this data out there. Let's see if there's anyone driving around that we can pick up. And I don't see anyone casually moving around. So, but anyhow, so you can go out to APRS.FI and check this stuff out and just look at it as a user, just casually, and it's worldwide. Like if I zoom out here, and I've made like radio only contacts with this with people like in Dayton and stuff, uh, which is, it wasn't too bad. You can see it gets like Europe's covered as well. So it's really cool stuff. Big topic, go check it out. That screen's for later. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and stop this again. Shouldn't need SDR Angel anymore. Okay. How am I doing on time? I've wasted 20 minutes already. <laughs> okay, so this is the slide here. This is a screenshot of, um, yeah, so here are the frequencies for APRS. Here in the US, it's 144.39 megahertz in North America. Over in most of Europe and Africa, it's 144.8. Uh, relevant, and I was in Poland a couple weeks ago. Here's a little screenshot of what we just looked at. So, in addition to APRS, uh, there's AIS, which is the Automatic Identification sh System for Ships. Ships broadcast their location all the time. Now, we're not anywhere near where there's any ships, so we can't do a demo of this. Uh, but ships broadcast their data. They broadcast their, their latitude, longitude, their heading, their speed, uh, identification, to so you, you know which ship it is. Uh, these are the frequencies it uses to do that. And there's some sites you can go to look at vessel information as well. And here is, and just like... Uh, the APRS stuff, there's a website uh, at vesselfinder.com. This is a little screenshot I took of it. You can see there's a fair amount of boat traffic up on Lake Erie, obviously a lot in the Northeast. And uh, what I think is kind of fun is that you can see down on the bottom, you can actually see the Ohio River. So when I do this talk in Cincinnati or Louisville, I actually can get some boat traffic. But here we're too far away. Uh, but this is another data format that's out there that you can pick up with a software-defined radio. And the one that is really kind of the star of the show today is ADSB. This is the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, uh, which is a bunch of words that I guess meant something to someone a long time ago. <laughs> it, it, it derives from an old friend or foe detection system that the uh, military used to use, I, I think during World War II even. I'm not sure how far it, go, it goes back. But the key thing is, is that much like the boats broadcast information about where they're at, aircraft do this all the time too. And so every aircraft has a transponder that broadcasts information about it at 1,090 megahertz. This information is called ADSB. Uh, includes the aircraft ID. So this is a unique identifier identifying that airframe. Uh, that's Elon Musk's. Uh, their call sign, which is their radio call sign when they're, uh, they talk to air traffic control. 
Lots of times this will just be the flight number. So if you're looking at a commercial flight, it'll be like Delta flight one, two, three, four. Their altitude in feet, even in Europe, the altitude is in feet. The altitude is always in feet. Freedom units forever. <laughs> uh, their speed in knots. Uh, their heading, of course, in degrees. And uh, their location in latitude and longitude. And uh, there's a convenient piece of software that will talk to a software-defined radio directly and uh, read this information for you. It's called Dump 1090. And this is a screenshot I took about nine months ago or so. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, this is totally coincidence. When I put this together, this talk, I realized this after the fact. Uh, the guy who created Redis, uh, Salvatore uh, San Filippo, is the guy who wrote Dump 1090. <laughs> he, he was like, over Christmas, he didn't want to relate to his family, so he wrote this instead. And so he wrote it like on a holiday weekend. Uh, but this goes and uses a software-defined radio and an antenna to pull that transponder data, that broadcast that's coming from the aircraft, and put it on a nice, neat display here. And so we're going to see that happen right now. So are we ready to look at some aircraft? Damn straight we are. OK. Don't need that. You all see my screen? OK, so I'm going to run dump 1090.-net-interactive. Dash 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 well, let's embiggen this a little bit. I apologize for the black background there. It makes it a little hard to see. So I've got, I don't even have my proper antenna hooked up. Let's go ahead and stop this. Stop that, stop that. And hook up the correct antenna. So I have right here an antenna purpose built for receiving ADSB trans, uh, transmissions. And so it will do much better than the antenna over there, which is not designed for that frequency. So let's hook that up, run it again. <coughs> okay, you see it's picked up OSU 10. That's probably someone flying out of uh, Don Scott. Uh, JBU 633, I'm guessing that's Jubilee Airlines. Now, uh, this is vertical. This antenna is horizontal right now. If I bring up vertical, it should pick up a lot more signals. Maybe not. But you can see it's picking up aircraft. If I walk over here, maybe it'll be better because it's closer to the door. Anyhow. Well, it's picking up stuff. I'm just glad it's picking up anything at all in this giant concrete bunker. Um, so here we got OSU Flight 10 and 15. Those are probably both, if you look at their altitude, they're low. Those are probably people who are learning to fly. Uh, this is American Airlines Flight 260, United Airlines 788. Right? So Dump 1090 is pulling data. This data is coming from the antenna that I'm holding in my hand here, and it is going on our screen, which is pretty cool in its own right, right? But wait, there's more. <laughs> so uh, I, when I watch this, I use the dash dash net option. And that means that it's got some ports open. If I go to netcat localhost, I can type 30,002. Here are the messages coming in. Uh, they're in hex, and then you decode them. One message would be like, my, my position is this. Another message would be like, my altitude is this. My, another message might be, I'm this, this is me, and I'm here. Uh, and so as messages come in, they're being displayed in hex. You can easily decode these. But you don't need to, because if I go to port 30,003, 30, I get something e even easier to parse. This is a standard called SS, uh, SBS-1, um, which is some sort of standard for like radio tower. I don't know what the standard is, but it's a standard. And because it's a standard, someone wrote a node library for it. And the node library will even open the socket on my behalf. So I literally say, go to localhost, this port, and start giving me data. And every single time one of these events comes in, I get an, uh, uh, an event in my JavaScript code. And so this is all that data that we're seeing coming in, which is, you know, doesn't look as cool as over here, right? But it's totally programmable. So let's go ahead and kill that. Uh, there's actually on port 3001, you can also, um, I'm not going to do this, but you can inject data as well. So if you had uh, multiple dump 1090s, you could feed them into a single one and sort of act, use it as like a hub or an aggregator. So what I've done is something crazy. I have built a thing. 
I'm going to go ahead and set the antenna down for now. And uh, that this thing will use this antenna and dump 1090 to take the uh, signals that are being broadcast by all the aircraft. And I'm going to dump them into an event stream in Redis. Because it's the perfect thing for an event stream, right? It's, it's, an event is a thing that happened with data associated with it. This is literally an aircraft saying, I'm here. That's an event. And so I'm going to shove them into an event stream in Redis. And then I'm going to consume that event stream and put it on a map. And we'll have a real-time flight radar based on where all the aircraft say they are. The Redis version that I'm going to use, and this is the advertisement part, <laughs> is a Redis stack. I will, I will say, in defense of this, is that uh, Redis stack is an amazing way to use Redis. It's, it's the version I use all the time. I've got an instance running right now. It's not just because I work there. It actually would be the version I would choose to use. Redis stack is the Redis you know and love, if you're a Redis user already. It's got all the things that open source Redis has, including streams. And it has some extra data types like uh, JSON, so you can store JSON documents as JSON. How many here have tried to store JSON in Redis and you put it in a string and then you need to change it, you get to pull it out and decode it and big pain in the butt? If you just store it as JSON, you can do commands to modify it. Uh, search, which will let you search over those JSON documents and your hashes. Uh, probabilistic data structures, uh, like Bloom filters and uh, Top K, which uh, is a whole other talk, and time series. So Redis stack is Redis with some extra stuff. And so we're going to use that to, to store our event streams. Uh, to do this, I, I've built this monstrosity of things that are allegedly microservices. <laughs> uh, I've got a series of radio ingesters, just one for today, but uh, if I use a cloud version of Redis, then my coworkers can ingest those as well. And so we can run multiple versions into the same stream. These ingesters then feed events into Redis, into a stream. I've got a little consumer, which we're not going to talk about, but it's out there on, in GitHub if you want to look at. All it does is consume that stream and then populate a hash for each aircraft data. So we're getting multiple messages about the aircraft, uh, and it just updates a hash in Redis with that aircraft's data. So the aircraft says it's at this location, and later on it says it's at this other location, and then you can go look in that hash and see where the aircraft was last reported to be, or last stated it was at. And then I put a little uh, REST API on top of that so you can access that data. And the other thing I do is I use a flight events web socket uh, producer, I guess you could call it, where it consumes that stream in Redis, and then whenever there's an appropriate message to send down that has information the client would care about, it's sent down a web socket, and this flight events does that. And then I build a little UI that brings that API and those events together to create a little thing we can interact with, and I front it all with an API gateway. So this is the big monstrosity that I've built. Uh, the only thing we're going to really look at is how, uh, the, uh, flight of, how we add things to the stream and how we get things out of the stream, and then we'll, we'll show you the map. Yeah, so let's talk about, uh, we've got the radio ingester here. We'll talk about that first. So uh, this, uh, in a warning, JavaScript code is coming here. This is how I've built this thing that I'm going to show you here. And so I bring in a couple imports. I use SBS1. That's the thing that we'll talk to... Uh, um, to dump 1090, and it literally is call create client, give it a host and a port, and then uh, we create a Redis client in the same way, uh, you, you basically giving it a host name and a port, and we connect both of those. Uh, with SBS1, we just say client.onMessage, and then we get a JavaScript object that has all the properties that it was in that message. It's that simple. This is not complicated code. It's not exactly the format I want, and so I've got some code here that, uh, transmogrifies this into something useful, like the dates are kind of in an unusual format, that kind of thing. And then uh, some of that is they're always there and some fields aren't always there, and so I got a bunch of ifs and stuff. This isn't particularly brilliant code, I'm not even necessarily proud of it, but all it's really doing is it's taking this JavaScript object that SBS1 spits out and turns it into a JavaScript object that I can append to a stream. So that's all it's really doing. And like you notice here, uh, the altitude I have to call two string on it, because streams and Redis require all of your properties to be uh, on them to be strings. Who here has used event streams before? Show of hands, a couple of you. So if you haven't used event streams, uh, who has heard of Kafka? This is like Kafka Lite. <laughs> um, 
Redis, open source Redis has uh, streams built into it. It's a data type if you're using Redis 5 or later. Uh, the idea of a stream is that it's a, a sequence of unique events that happen in time. By definition, they have happened, they've happened. They're not happening. They're not, you know, it's a moment in time. This thing happened. Like uh, if you had a bunch of household appliances that were feeding things to your streams, your, laundry, your, your dryer might say, I'm done. Uh, your microwave might say, ding. Um, those, someone pressed the doorbell. These are events. Uh, now you could have events in your software systems as well, things like someone uh, submitted a new order. Uh, in our case, our events are an aircraft reported their location. And in Redis, uh, the streams are set up as, well, in any event stream, they're really kind of a series of events that are stacked on top of each other. So in Redis, we've got an event that has an ID and data associated with it, and they're chronological. So they'll stack up over time. Uh, our ID in Redis is made up of two numbers. The first number is a timestamp, a Unix timestamp in milliseconds. The second number is a sequence number in case you get more than one event per millisecond, which is totally very likely. And then as they come in, they just stack on top of each other. And um, they, they're ordered, right? They're chronological. I, you kind of think of them like a log file. Uh, I don't know that I would want to capture a log file in an event stream, because log files are more informational, like, hey, I started this thing, this thing's happening. Uh, and it, it's probably too granular, but you could do that, I guess, if you wanted to. Um, that streams in like 30 seconds. Um, they're a useful data structure if you've got something that's chronological and you want to be able to uh, uh, replay it or uh, wait, wait for events to arrive. In Redis to use streams, you, uh, you call the xadd command. You give it a stream name. And on here, I'm using that little star there. Uh, you can provide an ID for your stream, or for your event, but if you use star, Redis will generate one for you, which is almost always what you want to do. And then you just provide key value pairs of data that are associated with that event. So here, um, an aircraft, uh, AC, or A835AF, which is Elon's, <laughs> uh, and call sign, uh, whatever that call sign is, has reported that it exists. And so uh, we create an event by calling xadd. xadd returns the ID that it was just created with. And we could go out and read the stream by saying xread streams, the stream name, and then the key we want to, the ID we want to start from. And this command will go out and read everything from that to the entire stream. Uh, this is probably not a command you'd want to run in production, because this would say beginning of time to end of time. Give me everything that's been in the stream so far. That stream's been running for a couple weeks and you've got thousands of messages an hour, that could be a lot of data coming back. And so um, what's more commonly done is you'll provide a count and a starting event. And then you tend to loop through it. So you'll start at zero and say, give me 10. And then it'll give you an ID back and you'll say, okay, give me the next 10 and the next 10 and the next 10. So you can bash them out. <coughs> to do this in code, uh, we use uh, Node Redis because I'm using JavaScript because I'm a glutton for punishment. I, I refuse to use even TypeScript unless I have to. But um, in Node Redis, a lot of the Redis commands are sort of pretty much one-to-one. -one. So you call xadd, give it a stream name, an ID, and your event data is a simple JSON object containing only strings. This is equivalent to calling that in, uh, in Redis. So then, that's the ingester. That's how I'm shoving things from, um, from the radio and from Dump 1090 into Redis. How do I get them out from my flight events? Well, uh, you can use the xread command with the block option. What xread block does is it says, read, um, and if there isn't anything, wait up to 5,000 milliseconds or however long you want until there is something. And if there isn't something, just return, hey, I didn't find anything. And then I've, you might notice that little dollar sign on the end up there. That dollar sign means start at the end. Give me new things. I don't, want to, I don't care about the past. I just want to start reading the end of the stream. You can actually use this as sort of a, a more robust pub sub mechanism or a robust queue if you'd like. To do this in code, oh, yeah, and so, so we block, it waits, we call add, and then we get something back from that block, that, that read.
And then here's the JavaScript code that does this. So uh, we start with our current ID as dollar, we loop forever, we call xread with block and a count of one, and then it's gonna return, excuse me, it will return stuff. Uh, if we don't get anything because it timed out, we just loop again. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and take the uh, result, the data, back and process it. And I'm, I'm gonna skip over the processing of that slide because it's a little chunky, but this is code that takes the, the data from that uh, result and uh, creates an event and publishes it over a WebSocket. Yeah. So this is just, yeah, here's the WebSocket publishing code. This is all on GitHub. It's code. I don't need to explain all of it to you. You've done WebSockets, presumably. If not, go read about it. <laughs> uh, the WebSocket server is not anything complicated, and the code is all out on GitHub. But basically, we're just, um, in that while true forever stream, we're just shoving things down to all the connected sockets. So that's the crazy thing that I wrote, kind of abbreviated. I want to show it off, because I think that's the more fun part, honestly. So let's go to the next demo slide. And we actually have a fair bit of time. It's possible I went too fast. <laughs> okay, so I've got uh, Dump 1090 is still running here, still picking up aircraft. It's doing remarkably well for the antenna being horizontal. So um, the, the angle of your antenna matters, or the polarization. So these are mounted on the aircraft upside down like this on the belly, and then they radiate out like this. And so if I want to pick them up, it needs to radiate back in on the same plane. If I have my antenna like this, it doesn't pick up nearly as much. It does much better when you hold it like this. So, and I'm just surprised at how many I've got given that I'm holding it wrong. So let's launch the radio ingester with a Docker compose up. And so now what's happening is it's taking all these events that are coming from dump 1090 and it's shoving it in an event stream in Redis. And I can prove that if I run Redis Insight which I should have had launched ahead of time, but we'll be fine. Okay, we'll go to the that local one. And if I, re, uh, let's go to, I want list mode, refresh. Here's my radio events. So here's my event stream. We got radio CMH. Uh, here is uh, the event ID right there. See, there's a dash one. We got more than one a millisecond. And uh, there, there's, if I refresh this, you can see that new messages are coming in. So this is just a, basically like a log of all the information about the event. So this aircraft was going 212 knots, whichever aircraft it was, at 277 degrees, climbing 64, it's not on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see each of these messages doesn't have the full, uh, full set of information. So this is going out, and if I refresh this again, we'll get new data again. And so I'm getting, you know, messages every millisecond, you know, multiple messages a second. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's go ahead and get the, the rest of this thing running. This is the uh, flight ingest, or the, the, the flight, it's everything else that was on that picture. The flight ingester runs separately. Oh, I just noticed you there, Greg, hi. <laughs> okay. So that's running. Now if I refresh this page, should re reconnect the WebSocket, and we see that it's finding aircraft in the area. They found one up near Marysville. Let's do this. We should see more pop up here. So these aircraft are aircraft that we're tracking in real time. JTZ-435, I have no idea what that is. Is there any other, oh yeah, we're picking up stuff up near Mount Vernon. Get anything further away? In here, I wouldn't imagine. Upstairs in my, my home in my office at, on the second floor, I picked up stuff all the way in Indiana. And so these are real-time aircraft. This is, the, the data that we're seeing on, uh, on this screen right now, right up there, that data came from this antenna that I'm holding up. It did not come from the internet. Uh, the maps came from the internet, uh, but the data itself did not come from the internet. It was coming exclusively from the air. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Let's go ahead and click on one of these aircraft. So um, I do have this link to FlightAware, so if you click on one of these, you can see this is Southwest Airlines Flight 656, the neighbor of the beast. Uh, 
It's in route and on time, arriving in 58 minutes to Chicago from Baltimore. Uh, now, th that information is not available all uh, broadcast. You just get the flight information. But you can see we're getting a lot of air. See how many aircraft are getting here? By the, by the way, uh, any, any guesses on how I made the uh, aircraft turn? You're like, oh, you just set the CSS to rotate it. I tried that, and it had like weird background effects and stuff. And so I actually just created 16 images. <laughs> rotated them in Photoshop. Um, Another thing here is you'll notice I've got the, uh, the ICAO number there. If I click on that, uh, this, is where, uh, my, this is what's stored in Redis for that aircraft, right? You can see the information on it is updating. And in fact, if we go back to Redis Insight here and close this and look at, uh, refresh our keys here, you'll see we've got a whole bunch of hashes now with aircraft data in it that's being populated as well. So if I go in here, I can see this is which aircraft this is and all the information I have on it. And if I refresh it and it's changed, yeah, get the updated data. So yeah, that's my cool demo. I think it's cool. It's, it's, it's some, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's oddly compelling because it's like, it's right now, it's real, right? I'm not going through the internet, like, you ever go in flight aware and you're like, oh yeah, there's aircraft and then I got data, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, this is like having like, a supervision. Like I could see all the aircraft around. So uh, it's lots of fun. Uh, this isn't the only thing you can pick up on the radio. You can listen to police scanners. That's always fun. Uh, actually, one time I was listening to police scanners and there was a report of a stolen, an unmarked police car was, was following a stolen vehicle uh, up to Easton here, actually. And, uh, and then they got on, started talking with the police helicopter and everything. And then I'm like, oh, let's go out to fly to her and see where the cop's at. And it's like, oh, yeah, there is a helicopter circling around <laughs> Easton. <laughs> uh, so lots of stuff. Um, probably the most disturbing thing that you can pick up uh, on, uh, on, with a software-defined radio are t uh, pages. Anyone got, you know those old school text pagers? Uh, you can intercept those and decode them, and, um, which I don't recommend necessarily. I mean, it's fun, but don't share what you read. Because who do you know that carries a text pager? Anyone? Shout it out. Doctors. You can measure uh, the, the, the rate of the text messages coming across uh, that network in HIPAA violations per second. <laughs> <laughs> Although, honestly, I've listened to police scanners and heard social security numbers. So, um, good times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, lots of cool stuff to go check out there. Uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? We got, we got 13 minutes. We'll just let that run in the background. I'm sure it won't use my battery up at all. So that's pretty much what I've got. I, we can take some questions, and I've got some, uh, some CTA slides here at the end, some calls to action. Uh, I'm going to do those first, and then we can do the questions. Is that okay? Cool. So um, if you want to play with this yourself, uh, you can go, uh, if you want to get Redis Stack, you can go to redis.io slash doc slash stack, get yourself a copy of Redis Stack, although I just do it. I do it from Docker all the time. It's the easiest way to do it. Uh, this is the links to the various SDR software that I talked about earlier. Uh, if you want to check out some AS trackers, there's some URLs you can go and, and look at uh, vessels in your area. Uh, online ADS, ADSB trackers. There's also one at Open Sky Network, which actually has downloadable CSV files with all the airframe data. So you could, you could actually take the, uh, the ID of the aircraft and say, oh, that's a Boeing 767 or something like that. And uh, Dump1090 is out there on GitHub. Um, I work for Redis, as, as you might have guessed. Um, and we've got a Discord server, discord.gg slash Redis. And I know that you all are using Discord because you're here at StirTrek, and you're probably asking questions on Discord. So uh, go out and join our Discord server if you have any questions about this stuff. I'm on there answering when I'm not on the road. Um, if you want the slides and code and want to go check this out and you don't want to look at all the links, you can scan this QR code and it will take you to the GitHub repo with everything in it. You can safely scan this. It will never give you up, nor will it let you down. And that's my last slide other than, hey, I'm Guy Royce. So uh, now, questions. Any good questions out there? I, I know that, yeah. So the question is, is, are the frequencies you can decode listed by the SDR software or the hardware? Uh, it's mostly the hardware. I, I'm sure there's a limit in the software, uh, but it, it's probably well below what, or well above what is actually physically possible. 
Uh, so it's mostly the hardware. Um, my this whole software defined radio that I'm using here can go from 30 kilohertz, actually I think it goes to 1.7 uh, gigahertz. Uh, I think that's where it stops. But that 30 kilohertz is actually a little bit of a hack and it really doesn't do, work very well below about 30 megahertz. But that's just a feature of that piece of hardware. And so you can buy different ones with different profiles. The cool thing about them though is that they, uh, they actually can sample a lot of bandwidth all at once. And so you can, uh, like with the police scanners, you can listen to like a megahertz of bandwidth at a time. And with the way the police scanners work, you actually need to do that. In fact, I had to buy two SDRs to listen to uh, all the stuff in, in the area because the ch all the channels uh, were spread across wider than that. Uh, but yeah, they can actually and can listen to quite a bit all at once, which is pretty cool. I know uh, there might be questions on Discord as well. I, I know someone was going to tell me that there were questions on Discord. Yeah, no. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so I have a slide with my call sign on it, so that's coming, uh, if you didn't hear it when I, uh, I did the radio test. Any other questions in the room? We got nine minutes, I can show off more, more fun stuff. Uh, I, I, I can't see very well, so. Well, whoever's got their hand up, ask. What was that kit that you would recommend starting out? Um, if I was starting, I'll go back to that slide. It's got the, Let's get back to that slide there. So the question is, what's the kit I was recommending? Um, I like this particular kit here. Um, it's, uh, the SDR is, honestly, I think the generic ones are cheaper and nicer. Um, but uh, this one combined with the, uh, the, the, this new electric SDR with the new electric up converter would give you much better access to HF bands. So if you want to listen to ham radio operators and shortwave radio across the globe, uh, that one's really nice. Um, another website worth checking out if you want to listen and you don't want to buy anything is you can go to kiwisdr.com, I think it is. Let me, let me check here. Uh, but uh, there are people that take these SDRs and an antenna and they just take the entire bandwidth that they're sampling, all 30, you know, from like zero to you know, 300 kilohertz to 30 megahertz uh, in the HF band and they just stream the whole thing down the internet. And then you can, uh, you can listen for free. So if I go to kiwisdr.com, you can go to a rx.kiwi.com, and then let's do a search for, and I know there's one here in Westerville. And I go here, and you get, yeah, I don't care about that. You get a waterfall. And so by default, it's tuned to uh, 10 megahertz, which is the uh, time frequency. You ever get one of those smart atomic clocks that it automatically updates the time? It's tuning to this frequency and listening. It's telling you what time, there should be at some point someone say, at the tone, the time will be. But, but you can go and listen to all kinds of stuff. So this is a fun way to get started if you uh, just want to play with listening and see what is out there. This is where I started and it led me down the rabbit hole, so. Okay, that's monotonous. <laughs> How are we doing on time here? We've got seven minutes, seven minutes. I feel like Bill Burr, right? <laughs> Talking to Philadelphia. Uh, uh, other questions? Uh, what, uh, the question is, is, do I know what protocol or what frequency uh, uh, life rafts and emergency things are transmitting on? I don't, actually. I have no idea. Uh, I would just Google it. <laughs> or ask Chat GPT. I guess that's what all the cool kids are doing today. Outside of the fact that you work for Redis, what is the compelling argument that you um, would put in on a net streaming system interacting with that versus telecast? Um, so, uh, Outside of the fact that I work for Redis, what is uh, the, basically what's the argument for using Redis streams versus Kafka? Uh, there's some trade-offs. Um, Redis can give you better performance, uh, but it doesn't scale quite as nicely as Kafka can. In Redis, an event is a key, or an event stream is a key, and a key is on a shard. And so, uh, and so whereas like topics in Kafka can be smeared across a cluster. And so, uh, and, and streams in Redis isn't really intended to compete directly head-to-head -head with Kafka. Uh, but if you have Redis already and you need an event stream quick and handy, then it's there. So, that, yeah. Uh, it does have an idea of consumer groups, which I didn't talk about. Uh, so you can, like, have several people, uh, several clients consuming a stream and then, uh, and then um, mark that as a process message or not. Okay. And so it does have some uh, more advanced features. I just showed the very briefest of brief. And it's also... Um, um, 
I, I lost it. I had a thought. <laughs> um, oh, uh, Redis, uh, in general, Redis tends to be a little more white boxed, where uh, a lot of the, like, like a race car is really fast, but you need extra expertise to drive it and work on it. Uh, and the way it gets that speed is by being a little more, by letting you control more things. Redis tends to be like that anyhow. The plumbing's left up to you. To, yeah, yeah. But you can get a lot of performance out of it. Depends on what, so, so it's a big consideration, depends on your use case. Um, is it possible to receive slash process radio signals from space with amateur equipment, not just from human sources like satellites, but from beyond? So the question is, is can you pick up uh, um, radio signals and stuff from space and not just from like satellites, but from beyond? Uh, I would refer you to my talk that I've given, uh, I think at Star Trek before called uh, uh, under, uh, understanding probabilistic data structures with 112,092 UFO sightings. No. <laughs> no. Uh, actually, there are people that use software to find radio and amateur radio equipment to do radio astronomy as well. You can totally do that. I have no experience with it. I know that's a thing. So there are actually hams that will even bounce signals off the moon, which is kind of cool. Uh, I've never done it um, because I don't even have my HF radio yet. I have my general license, but I don't have the right radio yet. Uh, and I probably won't do that for a while because it's kind of an advanced thing. But, but yeah, we can do that. Uh, any other questions we got? Oh, we got a couple minutes yet. Yeah. Uh, so if, um, what would be the approach if you want to utilize a, an actual rig as opposed to a, uh, an SDR? There are um, rigs that are, have, that are software enabled. You can buy... RX software defined radios, uh, and you can buy ones that do that over HF. I haven't looked into them much yet. I've mostly used the SDR for receiving. Uh, I have done some stuff with packet radio um, on two meter here in Columbus, and so you can do the AX25 uh, network you can use to create actual connections and send data packets. Like I can check my email uh, online that way and stuff. So, okay, I'm gonna go and wrap this up because there's someone standing there and I feel pressured. <laughs> it's all you. It's all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Outside, this is the one to be at. So there is. Let's get. There we go. There's my last. My almost last. So my name's Guy Royce. Thanks for coming. Um, follow me on on social media. I'm at Guy Royce pretty much everywhere. If you're ham. I'm Kilo Echo Eight. Victor India Yankee. And that's what I've got. Thanks a lot. <laughs>